We're starting a little bit late, but better late than never. Uh, my computer's up to 4% charge. So I think my computer problems were the battery was not charging and it died and then, yeah, wouldn't come back to life. But I, I jiggled the cord, tried a different charging port. It looks like it's charging now. So hopefully we're, we're good. So the only purpose of today's lecture is to do review for the midterm, which is tomorrow. And I just wanted to make one thing clear too, is the slides for chapter seven have at the end, uh, like 10 slides or something like that on alkynes, which we did not cover in class. That's not on the midterm, but just in case that wasn't super clear, just to make sure that you're not responsible for that. Is there anything people would like to see in particular? Any particular examples or any, uh, Things you'd like clarified or anything along those lines? Everyone knows it all. What are you doing here then? Do you want to know the structure a little bit of the midterm? Yeah, OK, well, we have 20 multiple choice. Uh, I'd say the multiple choice questions skew a little bit towards chapter six. Maybe like 60, 40 kind of thing. Mainly, I think, because chapter six has more, maybe like small detail ideas. Um, the kind of things we're looking for for multiple choice from chapter six is like, pick the mechanism based on the starting materials and conditions. This would be for like alkyl halides from chapter six. There may be questions like that as well. Chapter seven for alcohols, so alcohols in chapter seven alcohol halides in chapter six. Uh, maybe also, you know, rank alkene stability, mono, di, tri, tetra, that kind of thing. Um, rank carbocation stability. Um, maybe like, Identifying solvents as polar, a product, polar product, or nonpolar. Um, identifying which mechanism goes best with which solvent. So SN2 is best with polar A product, SN1 polar product. Uh, leaving group ability, which is the best leaving group, which is the, the worst in terms of the halogens. Um, which carbocations can rearrange, maybe? Question like that. Then we have the long answer, and the multiple choice I think are still worth 40%, which is a little bit cleaner, two points per question. Uh, the long answer is 60%, and these will have you, uh, I'd say there's sort of two main types of questions here. One is draw the product given the conditions. The other one is draw the mechanism given the conditions. So if we have a question where we ask you to just draw the major product, you don't have to draw all the steps of the mechanism. You just need to give us the product and that's it. Um, the way I usually mark that is if you get it right, you get full marks. If you give me a product that's possible, but not the major product, uh, that would be worth, I'd say partial points. Exactly what that looks like, I don't know. An example of that would be if I gave you a molecule like this, and I said draw the major product, and if you drew that, that'd be 100%. If you drew this, that'd be worth partial points, because that's a possible product, but not the major product. The Zaitsev rule would apply here. This one is tri substituted. This one is di, gem di. Um, another kind of question that I like to ask, which might appear on the midterm, is a question where I ask you to draw something for me and draw me an example of, and that could be anything from, was, it, was there one like that on the previous midterm? Yeah, I think so. I love those questions because when I grade these, I find they can get monotonous. And if there's just something that there's a little variety, at least it makes it a little more bearable to grade. So. I could say draw, I don't know, a tertiary carbocation or draw a polar A product solvent or something along those lines. It's, it's 
I, I find there's not a lot of material in these chapters. You might feel differently than me, but there's not a lot of material. It's just, um, when I say there's not a lot, it's not like there's, there's not a whole bunch of little minor points. There's a couple of big ideas. They may be complex and they may take a little while to absorb and understand them, uh, but it's not like a lot of picky little things. I don't think so anyway. What would you like to see? Yes. Yeah, state says rule, Hoffman rule. Uh, OK, let's look at an example like. We've got a rearrangement one too. Sure thing, Sam. Uh, if I have. A polar product, polar A product, I will do that as well. So let's say we have. This alkyl halide, which is tertiary. And we're going to react it under two sets of conditions. One is this, give it some heat. The other one is okay. Both of these are all coxides. Both of them are E2 conditions. The difference between these is one is small, which is the top one. Methanol, methoxide, and the bottom one is bulky. Got a whole bunch of questions there now. Great. Um, Zaitsev's rule says that when you have a small alkoxide, it's going to follow Zaitsev's rule, which says that the most substituted alkene is going to be the major product. So that means if you think of the possible products here, that's going to be one of them. And the other possibility looks like this. So this one is tri substituted. This one is di. Zaitsev's rule says that this is going to be the major product, which is what you'd form in the top case. If you have a bulky base, like the one we have at the bottom, then we follow Hoffman's rule, which says the least substituted alkene is going to be the major product. So you could pick which of these alkenes you wanted to form in major amounts in this example by choosing base and solvent you wanted to run this reaction in. Uh, let's go through some of these questions as they appear. I'm going to do Kimberly's first because it's quick, and then I'll do some of these other ones as well. Can you explain when you would do a front side back side attack with SN2? Uh, an example where you rearrange an alcohol. Yes, so I think Elizabeth's question and Sam's are, are similar here. First of all, polar product and polar A product. Polar product and hydrogen bond. So there are things like water, alcohols, it's got an OH, you can hydrogen bond. Um, carboxylic acids like acetic acid or formic acid. This one's formic acid. Uh, these are all polar protic because they have an acidic or we say exchangeable is the word we use for these. If they can hydrogen bond, they're polar protic. And polar A product, the product stands for the, the proton, like the OH. It's got that proton that can donate as a hydrogen bond donor. Polar A product does not have that, but it still has to be polar. So it has to have a dipole moment. So an example is acetone. It's polar, right? But it has no uh, OH on the molecule. We can have DMSO. We can have acetonitrile. I think the only other one we'd ever use would be DMF. It's got hydrogens, of course, but no OH. Uh, there's one other in the notes, the hexamethyl HMPA, hexamethyl phosphoramide, I think it's called, which looks like that's 
that's one that's in the notes, but we're, we, ne we never use that example. So don't worry about that one. Um, and then the rest, like nonpolar, would be things like alkanes, benzene, it's nonpolar. Ethers are weakly polar, so we classify them as nonpolar. Great. Thanks, Kim. We have questions about rearrangements. Uh, I'm going to get Brooke's question first because she says, when, will you explain when you do a front side, back side attack with SN2? So SN2 is always back side attack. That, that means is if you have a carbon with a leaving group, you know, and then you have the other groups attached, the, the nucleophile always comes in in a straight line behind the carbon in a straight line where you have the nucleophile carbon leaving group. And so what that means is you always get inversion. When you do an SN2. SN1 is different because SN1. Loses the leaving group first. To make a carbocation that's planar, it's flat. And then when you have the nucleophile come in, it can attack one face or the other face. And there's no preference, it's flat, like a sheet of paper. Doesn't matter which side it goes on. So you'd expect 50%. Actually, no double. So SN1 will give you 50-50, and SN2 gives you 100% inversion. Now, this only matters if you're on a secondary, uh, secondary alkyl halide for SN2, because you only notice inver inversion took place if it's a chiral center, and you can't have a chiral center if it's primary. If it's tertiary, you can't have SN2. It's methyl, you can't have a uh, chiral center. It's only secondary, does it matter? Uh, tertiary, it can matter for secondary or tertiary because you can have tertiary chiral centers as well. But yeah, you always get a racemic mixture when you do SN1. There are some weird examples where it's not exactly a racemic, and I don't want to get into the exceptions. For us, this is what, what's going on. Okay. Um, does that answer your question, Brooke? We can do a rearrangement question while we are waiting. So rearrangement, uh, an alcohol rearrangement, I think was the exact question we got. Let's look at BH3. I'm going to react this with HI. Okay, so HI is a strong acid, and I'm going to redraw HI to make it look like so we can see the bond and we can see the lone pairs. Uh, HI is a strong acid. Whenever you have a reaction mixture where there's a strong acid there at the beginning, proton transfer is almost always the first step. If you have a strong acid, it wants to protonate something wants to give its proton to whatever will take it. And in this case, the best acceptor for that proton is the OH. So what we're going to do is write out the acid-base reaction. Doing our curly arrows properly, they start at a lone pair. They point to the atom that's forming a new bond, so the OH bond forms. The HI bond breaks, the pair of electrons in the bond move to the iodine. So the second arrow starts at the HI bond and points to the iodine atom. That will create we have a new hydrogen. We have one lone pair left because we used one to make a bond. A positive charge. And now we have iodide, and it's got four lone pairs because it picked up one from the HI bond. Next, 
we lose water. Why do we lose water? It's a fantastic leaving group, right? OH minus is awful as a leaving group, but when you protonate it, it becomes really good. And don't forget this other group we have on here, the methyl. So that leaves us with a cation here. We have a hydrogen that's there. This was the same hydrogen that's here. Note how I drew that hydrogen in the carbocation as flat. Carbocations are flat. They're sp2 hybridized. They're trigonal planar. Don't draw, please, a carbocation like this. Because it's, it's showing there's stereochemistry there when there's not. Okay. Same thing if you have an alkene. Don't draw an alkene with wedged bonds coming off of it. That's also incorrect. Pleasant sound. Uh, OK, so we have this cation over here, and it's a secondary carbocation. Secondary carbocations are the ones we look out for for possible rearrangements. Tertiary we don't worry about, but this one we do. On the left side, you know, we look for beta atoms on the beta or, or groups on the beta positions that we could shift. Uh, the left hand beta, there's nothing good there to shift. It's a CH2. Uh, you never do a shift from a CH2. That's because if you shift a hydrogen over, all you're doing is making a new secondary carbocation. On the other side, we have a methyl and we have a hydride or a hydrogen. In this case, what we can do is we can take the hydrogen and pop it over. And if we do that, then that will make it so that there's two hydrogens up here, the original one plus the one that shifted. We have our methyl and we have a charge there. Notice the methyl, I didn't use the, the hash bond anymore. It's now a carbocation is now flat. So we're going to draw it flat. So this is a good rearrangement because it takes us from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation. Now the last thing, because it's HI, it's going to do substitution. And obviously it made the carbocation. So this is SN1. And what happens is our nucleophile that's still around here can come in and attack our carbocation. So we have, this is our product. Notice I did not use dash and wedge bonds in this product. The reason is, is this product is not chiral. There's no chiral centers. So if there's no chiral centers, right, if, if that's not a chiral center right there, there's not really any need to use dashed and wedge bonds. The reason we use dash and wedge bonds is not so we understand the shape, because we, we hopefully can look at that and understand that it's tetrahedral. We show dash and wedge bonds to make explicit whether this is an R or whether this is an S stereocenter. Because this isn't either, we don't need to draw it. If it was chiral, there would be more than one product. Yeah, so if you had, here's an example. Let's say we, no, I'm still on my eraser here. Let's say we had two methyls there, two methyls there. They're far away from the action. Two there, two there. And no, that's not good either. That's still not chiral. Um, okay, I can do this. There, 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 there. Now they're is no plane asymmetry anymore. So we would have to identify that as a chiral centered using ash and wedge bonds. There'll be that one plus the enantiomer. 50 50 because it's SN1. Yes. Um, how do we know it's going to do a hydride shift over the methyl shift? Okay. So the answer to that is. If you try to do a methyl shift on that carbocation, this is what will happen.
there's a hydrogen up here. There's the methyl. OK. The hydrogen that we didn't shift is still there. And there's a charge there. So that takes us from a secondary to another secondary, which doesn't help us out. Yes. And I'll avoid those. Okay. But here's an example. Let's say you have this carbocation. In that case, you could have either the hydrogen shift or you could have an alkyl shift from the other side. So in one case, you would get And then if the hydrogen shifted, you get this. Um, we're not going to, I'm not going to give you examples like this where you have to decide which of the two shifts are possible. Both are possible. Uh, the methyl shifts are faster, so you're more likely to get the methyl shift, but that's not really that, that's getting into a sort of a fine level of detail that um, we don't really have to know about. OK, Rebecca says if we draw a reaction that produces a chiral molecule, do we need to draw the an enantiomer as well? Read very carefully what we ask you in the questions. So I think the way it's phrased on this midterm is draw the major product in bracket S for each of these reactions. So that means if there is a chiral center and it's an SN1, draw them both. If it's an elimination and there's a major and then a couple of minors, just draw the major one. And we don't need the minor ones. It'll say major product or major product. And if you see products, think in your mind, this, this is a chiral one here. The only case where there's more than one major product, is that true? Well, there's some, there's some, maybe some other weird cases. So. Here's another example where there could be more than one major product. There's no question like this on the midterm. But let's say I gave you a question like this. Um, this one could eliminate to give you that. Or that. Both are try. They'd both be about the same in energy. I guess you could argue both of these could be major products. Uh, yeah, I don't we, we don't do that to you though. If you see major products and if there's more than one product, it's going to be a chiral pair. It's going to be SN1 typically. So yeah, SN1 reaction, think about that. Think about, are, am I making two different molecules here? Is my product going to be a chiral center? Um, can you go over E1 and E2 uh, mechanisms? Yeah. So do you want to see just examples of each? E2 is typically with an alkyl halide. E2 is when you have a strong alkoxide. Here we go, we got chloride like this. This is a secondary alkyl halide. And if you treat that with um, small alkoxide, we use always the same alcohol. The alkoxide was derived from and heat. And we should look for the beta carbons. In this case, there's two. So that one and this beta has a hydrogen as well. So what's going to happen here? So this is E2. This will pluck off that hydrogen. E2, everything happens at once. You pull off the beta hydrogen. You make the double bond. You kick out the leaving group all in one, one big step. You make your alkene. 
So I picked that particular beta hydrogen purposefully. I could have picked the other one, in which case the major product would be this. Uh, how would if that's the one I wanted to be major? How would I get that? Good. Yeah, you'd use a bulky alkoxide. If instead of using these conditions, we used the bulky one. That would give us this one's the Hoffman product. This one's the Zaitsev. That's D2. E1 is uh, the situation where you would have uh, the leaving group leave first. Generally speaking, E1, I kind of think of for alkyl halides as kind of a passive mechanism. If you don't have anything strong in there, like And you just heat this with water, say. These conditions would give you E1. And the the this, the thing that identifies this as E1 versus SN1 is the heat. If you see heat there, think elimination, not substitution. If there's no heat symbol there, or we say room temperature, or cool, or cold, or something like that, SN1, I'd like you to draw. Um, even though real life isn't that clean, Real life will kind of always give you a mix. But in this case, I want you to draw E1. The first step of E1 is the loss of the leaving group. There's nothing strong here to force the action. There's no strong nucleophile, there's no strong base, it's just water. Water's kind of listless. But water is great at stabilizing the formation of cations, like this cation and this anion. Now bromide floats away and we have this molecule and this is a tertiary carbocation and we have three beta carbons and we're going to pick one of the betas like this. We're going to take a molecule of water. This is our solvent and it's going to, in step two, pull off a beta hydrogen. Like that. Plus you have Br minus. Plus you have H3O plus now. It's products. So that's E1. Yeah. Um, on your Instagram, you posted a question about the anti trainer. Yep. And it's an E2 mechanism. I just yeah. E2 is anti coplanar. And I want to do an anti coplanar one. Uh, if it's on a cyclohexane ring, there's sort of two two times. Uh, every time you do an E2, it has to be anti coplanar. Um, there's the ones that are on the ring, and the ring ones are attention to the ring ones because you don't have free rotation. If you have a molecule that looks like this, uh, Cl, and you have This is going to do E2, and this is going to be the beta hydrogen we're going to remove over here. This is the alpha. Um, we don't worry about the anti coplanar in a molecule like this because there's free rotation about that bond. Those hydrogens can get themselves anti to the chlorine. It's spinning around. The anti coplanar is not really a restriction in a case like this, but it is a restriction if you are on a ring. In that case, what you need in order to have the hydrogen be anti coplanar is both the bromine and the hydrogen have to be axial. And you draw the chair form. And the hydrogen and the bromine, the, the beta hydrogen and the leaving group, have to be trans to each other. Right, so if you looked at I'm going to put two methyls there, so you don't worry about that side. If you look at the alpha and the beta, 
You could get elimination either by removing that hydrogen or that hydrogen in principle, but the only one that's going to do an E2 is going to be the axial one, the one that's down. It has to be anti and opposite to the bromine, and that will only be the case when they're trans. You see just above that in the example there. The other case where this can be kind of hairy is sometimes because on an open chain, if there's only one hydrogen that you can remove, sometimes you get either an alkene that's cis or an alkene that's trans as a product. And I think there was one like this on sapling, on the sapling homework. So here's an example. If I gave you Something like this. This molecule has one beta hydrogen. That's the beta and alpha. Uh, there's only one hydrogen here that's um, on the beta. It has to be anti to the chlorine. And the way I have this drawn, it's not anti right now. Okay, it's it's sticking off at some weird angle. It's gauche. So we need to draw this such that the hydrogen is anti to it. So what we're going to do is do a little rotation around that single bond, because we can do rotations around single bonds if they're not in a ring. And what you would get, this side looks the same. We want to rotate it so the hydrogen is down, opposite the CL, like that. And if you do that, if you rotate that around, the methyl comes out in front, and the ethyl goes in behind. Now it's lined up. You can have your alkoxide come in. Like that. And what you'll get is an alkene where the groups that are on that alkene should line up. They should be in the same direction as they are in this reactive form of the molecule. So what that means is this methyl here it's coming towards us, it's wedged, and the hydrogen there is back. And on the other side, the methyl is coming towards us as well. It's wedged, and the ethyl is the one that's going back. So if you want to draw the product like that, that's great. That's fine. Uh, it's kind of a weird way to draw an alkene, though. But that's OK. You can draw it weird if you want. A more normal way might be like this. So in this case, this gives you an E alkene. If instead we looked at a dimer of that starting material. So I'm going to give you now that. That looks an awful lot like the previous example, except I flipped one of the stereocenters. That makes these two diastereomers, these two. They're not enantiomers, because you have to flip all the chiral centers if you want to make enantiomers. We only flipped one. Again, we have alpha and we have beta. We have to rotate the, this around again to get it into a reactive form. So to do that, we're going to leave the right side the same because we I like the chlorine where it is. So we're going to flip it around so the hydrogen is down. And if you do that, you can imagine kind of taking the ethyl and pulling it into the front of the molecule. And imagine what that looks like. You're going to have the ethyl out in front, and that's going to push the methyl, which is in front now, into the back. Now we can have our alkoxide come in. It can do the E2. And what you get is an alkene. Methyl is in front here, so it's in front in the product. Hydrogen is in back in both, which is the same thing as 
this. This one is Z. So notice how in the top example, one diastereomer gave us the E, a different diastereomer gives us the Z. In fact, these two products are diastereomers, aren't they? So this is an example of a reaction we would call a stereospecific reaction, where a certain stereoisomer of starting material gives us a certain stereoisomer of product, and a different diastereomer of the starting material gives us only one, but a different diastereomer of the product, which is the, the definition of stereospecific. It's kind of a confusing definition, but um, that's how it's defined. So this is maybe the other case where anticoplanar can matter when you can make alkenes that can be E or Z. Not too complicated, is it? How are people feeling? Too much? The examples that we did in class today, I mean, I'm answering the question, they're the hardest, harder half, for sure, of the, the material. I would say like an important, you know, a first important thing to be able to do, which will probably get you up to a pass on this midterm, is be able to look at the conditions and identify the correct mechanism. There's a lot of questions like that on this midterm. Looking at secondary alkyl halide, uh, bulky alkoxide, E2, whatever it is, you know. If you can look at those charts, one for alcohols, one for alcohol halides, that that's like maybe not halfway, but it's a solid 40%, I would say, of the way to doing to getting towards the product. And once you can once you have that mechanism in your mind, drawing it out becomes very routine. So every SN2 looks the same. Every E1 looks the same. It's always the same steps. The only difference is now we have to worry about rearrangements in the case of SN1 and E1. Whenever you have SN2, you always got to invert the chiral center. We always ask you a question where we ask you to do a draw the product for an SN2 reaction, and it's always the chiral center. Make sure you invert the chiral center if it's an SN2. If it's SN1 and it's a chiral center, you'll get both an antimers 50-50. So draw both. Um, E2, E2 has this anticoplanar stuff that we just spent some time talking about, especially if it's on a ring, it's important. Because sometimes certain paths that look good on paper are blocked because you can't make the leaving group and the hydrogen be anticoplanar on a ring. You can always make them coplanar if it's on a, if it's on a compound that's not in a ring that can just rotate. But if it's on a ring, sometimes they're stuck. The hot beta hydrogen and the leaving group have to be trans in order for the reaction to happen. Um, I feel like I'm missing one. E1, E1's kind of boring. E1, it can do rearrangements, so I guess it's got that going for it, but that's about it. Now, the nice thing is, so so we've done, we've kind of done four mechanisms, but in terms of like number of reactions we've done, we've done a whole bunch. Because the SN2 on an alcohol is a little different than an SN2 on an alkyl halide. So you got to protonate the alcohol first. Um, what's left? Whereas we're going to do chapter eight. And chapter eight probably has around a dozen reactions. Uh, but the nice thing about chapter eight reactions is they're all like 10 times easier than the chapter seven ones. And the reason is, is there's no more wrenches. Most of these reactions do the same thing every time and you don't have to worry about competition. You don't have to worry about anticoplanar or this or this or this. All these little things that we're dealing with with these reactions, once you get them straightened out, hopefully it happens before tomorrow night, What's coming next? We're coming down the other side of the hill, if you know what I mean. There's going to be a lot of reactions. There may be stuff you got to remember. Uh, there's maybe new ways we can put combinations of reactions together, but the reactions themselves are more straightforward than the chapter six, chapter seven ones. In fact, I'll say this the reactions we're doing in chapter six and chapter seven 
the most difficult organic reactions in the entire book. So organic one, organic two, organic three, the hardest reactions are the first ones we teach you, E1, E2, SN1, SN2. Why do we start with the hardest ones? It's because there's so many, I feel like if you can understand this and absorb this, you're gonna be golden for the rest. Because the concepts, the ideas, you know, stability, solvation using different solvents, all these ideas apply in the exact same way to every organic reaction. Cool. We're a little over time. I have office hours starting at 9.30. It's gonna to run till 11 this morning, so there's a little extra time. If people are on and wanna have questions, send me an email if you need anything, and I'll be pretty available up until the time of the midterm. Thank you, everybody.